This is Arab Talk on KPOO 89.5 FM in San Francisco. This is Arab Talk with Jess and Jamal. I'm Jess Nam. And I'm Jamal Dejani. Jamal, um, not breaking news for you and me, but breaking news perhaps with Human Rights Watch, who for a number of decades now has been giving Israel a pass, has finally declared that Israel is an apartheid state. They published... Oh, uh, gosh, it must be a couple of hundred pages going through a very lengthy discussion about Israel's practices against Palestinians um, and have finally concluded, even though the rest of the world knows this and has known it for many decades, that Israel is an apartheid state. So we're going to be talking with uh, Diana Butu uh briefly about that. You did an excellent interview with her. But even though this is not breaking news to most of the world, this represents a pretty dramatic shift uh, in terms of the human rights community finally getting on board with calling Israel what it is, an apartheid state. Yes, this is uh, big news. I mean, it's been played down right here in the U.S., even though it was reported in the New York Times. Oh, we haven't heard anything. Reuters yeah. And, you know, a little bit more, actually, a little bit on CNN and more on CNN International. But you're absolutely right. I mean, this big report released uh, on uh, April 27th uh, basically says that Israel has a policy to maintain the domination by Jewish Israelis over Palestinians, including those who are its citizens, which is very important, right? Important, you know what they said. So, so this is this is a real big story, you know. Um, you know the Human Rights uh, Watch report. You said yeah, two hundred thirteen pages to be exact, entitled "A Threshold Crossed," states that the present day reality is that Israel is the, is the sole governing power, which we've been talking about it For all decades. the time, that Israel controls Palestine from the, from the Jordan River all the way to the Mediterranean Sea, regardless that there is a Palestinian authority in the West Bank, regardless that uh, uh, Gaza is under Hamas control. But nevertheless, I mean, regardless of all these things, Israel controls the whole land by air, land, and sea. So now Human Rights Watch recognizes this and says that the conditions for the population is a, an apartheid condition. Right. And of course, we heard the typical responses from the Israeli government, Jamal. Mark Regev said that the report was anti-Semitic. And that's the only criticism that we're hearing from the Hasbara brigade that is coming out now trying to defend the uh, Israeli apartheid state now saying that the Human Rights Watch is now peddling anti-Semitic news about uh, Israel. We should remind our listeners also, by the way, that a number of Israeli NGOs, have all, including Beth Salem, have also called Israel an apartheid state. So actually, Human Rights Watch, Jamal, is a little behind the times, even in comparison to some Israeli NGOs. Has, has the most uh, credibility on the international level. But, you know, we're going to talk about this. Let's first listen uh, to Diana Buto, who's talking to us from, uh, she's on the ground in Palestine. Israeli authorities are committing the crimes against humanity of apartheid and persecution. Human Rights Watch said in a report released on April 27th, the finding is based on an overarching Israeli government policy to maintain the domination by Jewish Israelis over Palestinians and grave abuses committed against Palestinians living in the occupied territory, including East Jerusalem. Also this week, the world has witnessed images and videos of Jewish extremists who, emboldened by their political patron's recent election to the Knesset, marching to Jerusalem's old city and chanting death to the Arabs. Joining us from Palestine to discuss this and more, Diana Buto. Diana is a lawyer and former legal advisor to Palestine Liberation Organization Chairman Mahmoud Abbas and Palestinian negotiators. Welcome again to Arab Talk, Diana. Thank you, Jamal. Thanks for having me again. Let me start by the big news of the day. 
Human Rights Watch is saying what Palestinians and human rights activists have been saying for years in its 213-page report titled A Threshold Crossed, Israeli Authorities and the Crimes of Apartheid and Persecution. Somehow it falls short of calling Israel outright an apartheid state, yet uh, it says that Israeli authorities are committing the crimes against humanity of apartheid and persecution. Let's clarify this. What's, what's the difference between the two? There really is no difference. That's, the, that's the, 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 the crux of it all. I think what they're trying to do is trying to split hairs. The, I think for them, the idea is that there are acts of apartheid that are being committed that need to be addressed, but that unlike South Africa, which, is, which was modern day South Africa, which was founded on apartheid, I think they're trying to fall a little bit short of saying that it, it meets that threshold, um, that it wasn't based on that. I, of course, disagree. And many others, of course, disagree as well. We know that Israel is an apartheid state. It's been practicing apartheid for many, many years. And what's fascinating with all of these reports, Jamal, is while they're very welcomed, I very much welcome the B'Tselem report, I very much welcome the Human Rights Watch report and other reports, uh, I think it's important to keep in mind that Palestinians have been saying this for quite some time. We've seen academic after academic write about it. We've heard activists talk about it. Uh, we even labeled the wall, the Israeli apartheid wall. We've seen Israeli apartheid week take place around campuses around the world since 2005. So this is nothing new. What's new is that we finally see that one of the largest human rights organizations is also calling a spade a spade. And, and that part is very important. Well, how damaging is this to Israeli image, which uh, Israel and its surrogates uh, in the US and elsewhere spend uh, millions of dollars each year trying to improve and repair? You know, what is the expression? Um, you could put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. And, and that's what Israel has been trying to do for all of these years. They've spent, uh, as you put it, millions of dollars in Hasbro and trying to, in propaganda. But at the end of the day, we, we know what the reality is. Look, for me, the bigger question is what's going to come of this report? It's very important that this report is out there. It's very important that people are beginning to see the light. But I think for me, the bigger issue is what do we do with this report? And this is why I was hoping that, and I'm hoping that uh, Human Rights Watch adopts the BDS movement, they push forward with BDS, because if we see that, that apartheid existed in South Africa and was addressed through international condemnation and sanctions, then so too apartheid that exists in Israel can be addressed through international condemnation and through sanctions. Well, uh, okay, well, then the big question would be, uh, what about the decision makers, the big players in the US, Canada, the UK, and the EU? Uh, now, what's going to be their excuse? I mean, they've been attacking the ICC, uh, the United Nations, whenever uh, they had a resolution, the, the, the US will intercede on behalf of Israel. So do you think that's going to move anything? Look, these are small steps, and I think that they do move things, but I think it's going to take a, a long period of time for many of these countries. Don't forget, Shemal, that there's been a lot of not just Hasbro, not just propaganda that's been affected in these countries, but there's been a lot of lobbying. And unlike in the case of South Africa, where they didn't have as active a lobby as the, as the Israel lobby does, um, we, we saw that the things also took a long period of time. So imagine what happens when you have a very strong, very active lobby in all of these countries that are pushing to make sure that the truth is hidden and to make sure that that policy remains firmly on side with Israel. Uh, one thing that's interesting, and, and I think it's important to add, is that for Israelis, Israelis know that this is apartheid, and they actually talk about it very openly. Um, it's not like this big taboo secret. It's when the B'Tselem report came out, it, it barely elicited a yawn. And when we've heard uh, U.S. presidents, including Jimmy Carter, call it apartheid, again, it didn't, it didn't really uh, elicit this massive outrage inside Israel. In fact, I, I remember that as, as far back as 2016, where we've seen newspaper ads um, talking about apartheid and the response has always been in these newspaper ads, like you might not like the label, but it is what it is. 
So in, inside Israel, this it hasn't been this earth shattering result to actually label it apartheid. And this is why I think it's so important for the international response to be just that much stronger, that if we do believe in systems and accountability, law and order, and so on, when you see these types of reports and you see these international institutions and organizations um, that are out there that can be available to remedy the situation, this is where it becomes so important for us to be pushing on that front. I don't think the Israelis themselves are going to change. In fact, as I put it, they've already, they're already kind of yawning about the, about the report. But I do think that it's important for us to really be hitting home in these various countries to make sure that Israel doesn't continue to get away with it. And it may take time, and I'm convinced that it's going to take time. But I also believe that we have justice on our side and we have truth on our side. And it's becoming much more difficult for Israelis to pretend that there is nothing. When you see the Peter Beinarts of the world, when you see the Nathan Thralls of the world, um, people who were either hardcore Zionists or soft Zionists beginning to change their tune, that's more of a question, that's more of a reflection of where American Jewry is um, rather than, and where where Israel is in terms of wh- the way that they see Israel than it is of anything else. And so it's important for us to continue to push home on these, on these issues. I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, they're not gonna change unless there is some uh, repercussion and they haven't seen that. However, I was reading through the report and it's also calling on the ICC office of the prosecutor to investigate and prosecute Correct. those credibly implicated in the crimes against humanity of apartheid and persecution. It also says countries should do so as well as in accordance with their national laws under the principle of the universal jurisdiction. So it talks about bans, uh, travel bans. It talks about assets freeze. It talks about arresting officials. I mean, our country is going to act because always whenever something like this happens, Israel somehow kind of uh, circumvents this by having, uh, you know, backtalk negotiations to protect its officials, for example, from tra- traveling into the EU. I mean, yes. just let's just make it as simple as this. They never get arrested. Yes. Look, I, will it happen? I don't know. I hope that it will. And I, I hope that, you know, one of the things Shema, that has been so frustrating um, being here and living here has been this double speak that we've heard on the part of the international community. So on the one hand, the international community is always chastising us and cast, you know, and saying all of these things of how we need to follow international norms, international law, and couch ourselves in terms of international legitimacy and so on. And yet at the same time, when, when that, that hoop is jumped through, and when we do do it in those terms, we see that they're also very uncomfortable with it. So they want us to be in a situation where we're constantly just attempting to negotiate our way out of apartheid, uh, colonialism, dispossession, occupation, and they're not willing to do anything about it. In other words, they've they've raised their hands and pretend that they have nothing to, to do with this. The big problem is, however, is that they have everything to do with it. It's all of these countries that have enabled Israel, whether financially, politically, or by turning uh, a, by by turning a, a cheek, right, by turning away and looking away, that all of these countries have actually been complicit in all of these actions that Israel has been carrying out. And I remember very distinctly in two thousand and four when the decision on Israel's wall first came out in July of two thousand and four. Again, this was very much applauded by the international community. Yes, Palestinians have gone the right technique. They're not using violence. They're using nonviolent means. And yet we turned around and said, great, now are you going to help us? They suddenly ran the other direction. So one of the the important things about this report is that, that we do see that international organizations are coming forward and saying the same thing. And it lays the groundwork for uh, for the ICC and for others to be able to use this and to be able to carry it forward. So that part is very important. My skepticism remains with the fact that at the end of the day, the, these nation states are a boys club and they're not going to do anything to harm one another. Um, you know, it's you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. And if it's the Palestinians who end up having to 
to be uh, to pay that a very heavy price. They, they do it time and time again. The important thing, though, is that we have these tools and that we continue to push for them, and we continue to highlight just how just just how uh, two faced and how, and the auda- and the audacity that these countries have in terms of telling us how it is that we should behave. If I hear once more from another country about how it is that we should be behaving, um, you know, it's, it's very, I can very simply turn to them and say, well, and you've also got all these international reports that are telling you how you should be behaving as well. So, you know, let's, let's just stop it. Um, so anyway, that's the, that for me is the, the, the major point is that I'm not, I'm not convinced that they're going to do anything because of the old boys club, but I do think that it's important for us to continue to push. Moving to the recent events in uh, Jerusalem, things have uh, a little bit calmed down since the Israeli removal of the barricades put uh, in in Damascus Gate, but the occupation has not disappeared. No. Uh, the racist Kahanists are, are going nowhere. They're actually now in the, in the Knesset and, uh, and beyond. So what's going to happen next? Is this just like a temporary kind of like uh, calm down until we see the next big event? Yes, that's all it is. Um, look, the, the Israelis have been trying to block off access to the Haram al-Sharif for decades now. And, and they've really escalated over the course of the past few years, where we've seen that they've tried to limit um, the ability of people to go into Al-Aqsa. They've tried to, they've tried to put those metal detectors, uh, and that went nowhere. It caused actually a lot of protests and people killed, but it went nowhere. Now this with the barricades, and again, they've had to take it down. Um, but along the way, Jamal, it's what they do is they go two steps forward and then half a step back. So even now, even though they've removed the major barricades on the steps, the, the large steps uh, going down to, to Damascus Gate, we still see that they still have military outposts there, something that came as a result of the last um, series of, it, of it, protests it's a, that It's happened. a permanent one because I, I, I remember before they used to have a couple of uh, uh, soldiers down by, by the gate, but now they have like two sheds on each side of exactly. the entrance. Exactly. Two, and they're made out of, they're made out of uh, concrete and, and brick. Um, so this isn't just a, a, a little structure they're going to remove. So again, it's two steps forward, one step back. One thing that we should be looking out for is this this coming weekend on May the 9th and 10th, because that is uh, what the Israelis call Jerusalem Day. It's the the, the joyous, and I repeat joyous for them, um, commemoration of the occupation. So instead of them looking at themselves in the mirror and saying, we are colonizers and occupiers facing international condemnation, this becomes a big rally day. And on Jerusalem Day, um, you'll see that once again, as they do every single year, you're going to see these same kahanists and these uh, the, these is- Israeli, mostly youth, um, go in through, through the old city and terrorize Palestinians who are living in the old city. I've seen them, I personally witnessed them um, spit at at shopkeepers. I've seen them steal from shopkeepers. I've seen them um, shout in the faces of of shopkeepers. I've heard them um, say racist uh, statements in in the face of Palestinians there. Um, I've seen them try to take the hijab off off of women as they're walking down the streets all in an attempt to show how strong and their their macho-ness and so on. So there is, I mean, recently also a call uh, by one of their MKs to strip uh, Palestinians with Israeli citizenships uh, from their yes. citizenship and basically get rid of them. Correct. That is uh, Smotrich. Smotrich is a member, he's the head of the Religious Zionism Party. He's a former minister of transportation and his exact words were, um, Arabs are citizens of Israel for now, um, you know, for the time being. And, and so he is talking about this. So we will continue to see this because the, this, this latest round is over, but the battle continues. We still, we have these Kahanists now that are in the Knesset, these Kahanists who, who are openly supportive of ethnic cleansing and now have, 
um, parliamentary immunity. And so we're going to continue to see much, much, much more of this. I read today in Al-Quds newspaper, uh, a newspaper uh, close to President Mahmoud Abbas, that Abbas uh, wants to delay the elections. Correct. Uh, supposedly after pressures from the U.S. government based on, on the idea that the Biden administration is about to give, I and mean, this, is, this is their ed editorial uh, or article, that Biden, the Biden administration is about to give uh, Palestinians some uh, rewards like the reopening of the PLO office in Washington, D.C., the uh, reinstatement of aid to, to Palestinians, uh, and uh, supposedly this according to US the U.S. government thinking that this will uh, give incentives to vote for moderates and avoid loss uh, for the main Fatah faction. What's the real story? <laughs> <laughs> Look, the real story is, is, is definitely not that. And it's a little bit more complicated. Um, when the elections were announced, I think that Mahmoud Abbas was thinking that this was going to be an easy sail to victory. And, uh, and incidentally, this is the way, the way that he thought in 2006 as well. Um, he was surprised that Hamas won those elections. And, uh, and so I think he was also thinking the same was going to happen here. What he ended up seeing is that Fatah not only split, but it split into four different lists, four different factions. And with those four different factions, you're now talking about a split vote. With a split vote, there's no way that Fatah is going to win a parliamentary majority. And on the other side, we see that Hamas submitted one list, um, as normal political parties do. And which means that their vote is not going to be split. So it was a, it's been a combination of seeing that these votes, these lists have split, but not just the lists have split, but who is on these other lists. The fact that we have one list um, that consists of Marwan Barghouti, who's infinitely more popular than Mahmoud Abbas, alongside with Nasser Kudwa, two of whom show that they have both the ability to garner popular support as well as political support, uh, I think very much intimidated him. And what they're using is they're using the fig leaf of Jerusalem in order to, uh, to cancel. They use the term postpone, but it's not postpone, it's cancel. Um, why do I say that it's a fig leaf? Let me be very clear in saying that voting in Jerusalem is very important. It's of it's so important uh, to me as a as a Palestinian. It's very important on on all levels. I, I don't want to discount it at all. And we saw just with the course over the course of the past week that the resistance that we saw by people in Jerusalem is is so vitally important to um, to our struggle and to even to lifting our our spirits. They're the ones who are on the front lines when it comes to Israel. Now, while, Jeru while elections in Jerusalem are important, it's important also to put elections in Jerusalem in their proper context. Um, of the more than 100,000 Palestinians who've registered to vote from Jerusalem, the Israelis only allow a maximum of 6,300 to vote inside, uh, inside, the, inside Israeli um, uh, inside uh, Israeli post offices. Okay, so and this isn't new. This has been from from when the when the Oslo was first signed in the '90s. Um, we saw this happen in 2005 with the election. Again, 2006 with with, with that election. That under the agreement that was established or that was signed with Israel back in the '90s, Palestinians a maximum of 5,397. This is up until 2006. Palestinians were, were able to vote in the in in the post offices in Jerusalem. It's now increased to six thousand three hundred because there's now six post offices. What that means is you're looking at the vast majority of of Palestinians from Jerusalem, over a hundred thousand, who end up voting in different places. They either go to Ramallah or they go to um, to Bethlehem or they go to Bir Nabala or they go to any one of the numerous voting stations that are that are outside of um, those post offices, outside of those six post offices. And that's important to keep in mind. So 
what Mahmoud Abbas is talking about is he's saying that unless he can guarantee, unless there's a guarantee given that East Jerusalemites can vote, he is going to postpone the elections and we're going to probably hear about it this Thursday. The problem is, is that unless you actually scratch the surface, you don't really know what he's actually talking about. As I mentioned, there's only six, the, the post offices can only handle a maximum of 6,300 voters. This is by agreement with Israel. And the vast majority vote in, in other places anyway. Plus, if there's one thing that COVID has taught us is that you can vote in different ways. You can have electronic voting, you can have voting by fax. You can, there's many, many, many ways. I think that while it's important to focus on Jerusalem because Jerusalem is quite central, the part that he seems to be ignoring is the impact that it's having on candidates in Jerusalem. The fact that we see that candidates are being arrested, the fact that we see that election activities are being shut down, the fact that we see that, um, that candidates who are from Jerusalem are saying that they're afraid that their, their IDs, that their um, permanent residency status is going to be stripped from them because this is what Israel did in the elections in 2006. These are things that shouldn't be discounted or taken lightly. What instead Mahmoud Abbas is, so, is focused on solely is the actual casting of the ballot, um, putting a ballot into the box. And I think that the more important thing that he should be focused on is what it's like to be in Jerusalem and actually voting. And, and that part he doesn't care about. So instead, what we see is that now this is going to be the reason that they're going to come forward and actually um, cancel, uh, cancel the elections. And I do suspect there's a lot of talk right now that there is a, a unity government that's about to be formed between Hamas and between Fatah. And the reason that they're going to form it is because it's really in no, neither of their interests to actually hold elections. Both want to see that there are no elections, but yet both want to continue to rule. So this is what I suspect that we're going to be hearing um, over the next few days is the cancellation of elections with the excuse given that, um, that, that voting in Jerusalem can't happen and that instead we're going to see a unity government form. What's Israel's uh, role in this? You, you spoke about the fig leaf. I mean, could Israel be the one providing the fig leaf by, because they know if this is the condition that Abbas has put forward, it's very easy for them to prevent Jerusalemites from voting. They've done that in the past. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and not only are they providing it, um, I think it's important, Jamal, to put it also in, the, in its proper context. In the elections that, that there were in the, in, in the 90s, and then the elections in 2005 and the elections in 2006, there was the ability to vote in at, at these various post offices, but um, they also gave candidates and they've given candidates a hard time for a long period of time. And uh, But now what's changed is that we now see that this administration has been completely and totally emboldened by the US government. Uh, we saw that it got emboldened when, when the Trump administration illegally moved the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And we see that they continue to be emboldened when we see that the Biden administration has done absolutely nothing to reverse it. In fact, we saw a vote that went the exact opposite way, that people voted to keep the embassy where it is. So um, this is a government that has been completely emboldened. So why would they ever think to, to back down and to allow Palestinians uh, to vote, it's a sign for them that they're not the sovereign. Plus, if they don't really like what the outcome of the elections are going to be, of course, why would they allow uh, Palestinians to vote? So for Israel, this has been a perfect scenario. Um, they're emboldened by the US, nothing happening. We're hearing nothing from the Europeans and from Canada. And, uh, and then at the same time, Abbas doesn't really want to have these elections because he doesn't want to see the results. So of course, Israel can, can continue to get away with it. Diana Buro, thank you again for coming on Arab Talk. My pleasure. Thank you, Jamal. Thanks for having me. That's Diana Butu on the ground uh, reporting on the Human Rights Watch uh, report and elections, potential elections uh, coming from Palestine, Jamal. Diana always offers incredibly insightful analysis for us, Jamal. And based on what you heard from her, are you on the optimistic or not so optimistic side about the impact of this report 
for day-to-day -day life for Palestinians? Well, I don't know if I'm, I'm, I'm not, uh, obviously I'm not op optimistic because daily life for Palestinians keeps getting worse. I mean, attacks by uh, extremists there, the Lahava and Kahanist groups on Palestinians, arrest of Palestinians, the facts on the ground that there is an occupation, Gaza is under siege. Nevertheless, and this is why, this is the important thing because those things, and Diana said that, every, every step, uh, you know, whether it's the B'Tselem report, the, now the Human Rights Watch report, the ICC, they're not going to bring Israel, you know, to its knees immediately to kind of denounce its practices. But they all accumulate right. and hopefully put the, they will put the pressure to end this. I don't know if it's going to happen t tomorrow. It's not going to happen tomorrow. It's not going to happen a month from now. It's going to happen. It's not going to even happen a year from now. But eventually, until the word, the word, and I say the word in general, wakes up, starting with the United States and the European Union, they all wake up and recognize their basically mistake in not recognizing what's, ho what's happening on the ground and always trying to whitewash Israel crimes. And we have, what we have on the ground is similar to what happened in South Africa. And some people say it's even worse. Right. I mean, even South Africans themselves, South African activists and leaders, they've said when they witness what's happening on the ground, that this was even worse. And then until they recognize this, this big A, I would say, the A word, A for apartheid, the United States has to recognize it. Well, I, the I, I think, you know, I want to say something about that really quick because, you know, this week also saw, or last week saw the, the statement by Joe Biden finally saying the words genocide in relation to the Armenian genocide and massacre that occurred in 1918. Uh, after world during and after World War One, and it was interesting to hear some of the uh, Israeli apologists and APAC uh, supporters, like Adam Schiff, for example, who likes to claim himself to be a very progressive Democrat. He said, and this is a paraphrase, because of. Uh, Joe Biden's statement on the Armenian genocide, the United States will no longer let these atrocities from any country, he said, go unnoticed. Well, I have a little I'll have a little question for Congressman Schiff. Why are you continuing to be silent on Israeli apartheid? Why do you continue to be silent on Israeli military uh, arresting Palestinian children and torturing them? Why do you continue to allow the brutality that's going on against Palestinians living in Jerusalem and the ethnic cleansing there? If you're true to your word, uh, you know, you, let's see, put up or you know what, let's, uh, let's see what he has to say about that. Because I think, you know, if they're going to go this far with Armenia, why aren't these politicians going the next step? Exactly, and that's the Israel exception that we've witnessed for seven decades. Is this going to change? Well, this is what's going to, going to change. Like, like, just actually, just what Diana spoke about. Every single resolution, every single decision, every single statement by these human rights organizations is going to, it's just actually... It's good news. It's good news for the Palestinians because more and more people are gonna, going to learn about the situation on the ground. Now, the politicians may choose to bury their heads in the sand, but not the public. The right. public is very much aware, whether it's in Europe, the United States, the rest of the world. I mean, here we have, within one year, just one year apart, the ICC ruling, Beth Salem Report, an Israeli human rights organization, and then finally, you got Human Rights Watch. They are all saying basically that Israel is committing crimes against humanity. And, and this falls under the 1973 International Convention, by the way, when we talk about apartheid, on the suppression and punishment of the crime of apartheid, defined 
how they define uh, apartheid, and they say as inhumane acts committed for the purpose of establishing and maintaining domination right. of one racial group of persons over any racial group of persons and systematically oppressing them. This is also the 1998 Rome Statutes to the International Criminal Court, which, which it adopted basically in 1998, which means... If you're committing crimes, if you are part of this whole apartheid regime, you're punishable by law. Am That's I wrong? Am I no, reading this wrong? No, you're correct, Jamal. And the ICC has decided to take this on as part of their charge to look at Israeli crimes against humanity. You know, they're going to do their investigation. Another report will be coming out about that. My hope is that the Bet Salem, the H, the Human Rights Watch, and... Um, all of the pressure that's coming to bear on the Israelis right now will continue to put pressure on them and pressure from other sources around the world to face up to the ugly reality. And we need to get people, we need to call people out like Adam Schiff and other people who ride on the coattails of uh, Joe Biden and their declaration with the Armenian uh, genocide. You know, justice, you can't go, you can't, you can't just accept justice halfway, Jamal. You're either in or you're out. And we can't let the Adam Schiff's and the Israeli Hasbara apologists off the hook by claiming this moral victory for the United States when the United States continues to support the Israeli government and military to the tune of over $3.5 billion a year, loan guarantees, and protection uh, on the international stage. Well... Uh, and you mentioned the word Hasbara, and so you're absolutely right. The Hasbara machine it's and surrogates unbelievable. right here in the United States is going to be... Actually, they're now stunned, to tell you the truth. They don't Usually know what to do. They react yeah. fast, yeah, yeah. faster than this. They haven't reacted, but I'm sure they're concocting a line of defense in the media, be it in the New York Times um, and getting statements from, you know, getting signatures. They, they usually, APAC runs to Congress and basically dictates, they send them an email to copy and paste all the talking points. Right. I haven't seen that yet. That This, will, this is going to come out. They're just like, basically, they are working the language to say that Israel has been singled out. And then there is that other defense, you know what they use, the what about, what about this and what about that, the what, what aboutism, right? right? What about the, the, what, what's happening in China? What's, what, what about what's happening in Myanmar, you know? So they'll start, and Israel has been singled out, and, and um, then they'll start attacking, uh, just like they've attacked the ICC, they'll attack Human Rights Watch, even though, by, by the way, the executive director of Human Rights Watch is Jewish. Yes. And, and it took a long, long time for, for Human Rights Watch to, to use the, the, the uh, A taboo A word. Yes. And they've used it. So, so you know, you know, someone famous, and I don't know if I can, yeah, I'm just paraphrasing, once said, you cannot chine turd. <laughs> and, and, and at this point... When you have three major organizations in one year, you have UN resolutions left and right. You have, I mean, I mean, if we don't have a human rights watch to go to, or we don't have the International Criminal Court to go to, who do you go to? Well, you don't. You 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 have nothing as a as a collection of entities worldwide to hold uh, thugs and rogue states accountable, Jamal. We need the United Nations and these human rights organizations to hold these rogue states and uh, apartheid practices accountable. They were successful somewhat in South Africa. And, you know, we have to say South Africa still has some growing to do in terms of, you know, their their apartheid practices, but at least they were called out and they attempted to make changes. We we and the rest of the world should never let Israel off the hook, Jamal. And it seems like our focus should be the United States because it's really the cover by the United States that allows Israel to continue to engage in the apartheid practices of ethnic cleansing against Palestine and Palestinians. I want to say one more thing. I should. I, I had one problem with the Human Rights Watch uh, report, Jamal, and they only kind of 
they only went back to 1967 as as kind of the beginning point. So I I I have an issue with that because as we know, the apartheid practices and the ethnic cleansing actually started in 1948 and, you know, perhaps even before that with the British mandate of Palestine. So, um, you know, small steps. Look, look, the Palestinians who remained, what we call 1948 Palestinians, the ones who were not ethnically cleansed. Well, some of them were ethnically cleansed from their villages, but moved to another village, but stayed within under Israeli control. They couldn't travel up until 1965. That's right. From 1948 till 1965, they couldn't go from one village or one town to the other. Like, let's say you're a Palestinian living in Akka, you couldn't travel to Haifa without getting a special permission from the Israeli military up until 1965. And those were Israeli, supposedly Israeli citizens. Well, Jamal, and you know, we, we have to remind people that this started in 1948 with the Israeli apart- apartheid and ethnic cleansing. And we have to go to the present. I mean, you know, one of the things that is lost on all of this Hasbara, you know, Hasbara attack on the Human Rights Watch uh, report is the fact that Palestinians in Jerusalem continue to be under attack by illegal Israeli settlers, extremists, terrorists, Israeli terrorists, who are attacking Palestinians in Jerusalem on a daily basis, Jamal, during the month of Ramadan, and at a time when they're denying Palestinians access to be able to, you know, uh, you know, engage in the holiest month for Muslims in the world, and one of the holiest sites. So and- why isn't that being talked about? Well, well, I mean, again, like I said, that expression, you cannot shine to earth, is that people saw those images, Jess. Right. The U.S. US congressmen, except of the few, like uh, Representative McCollum and, and, and few others, spoke against this. They've watched on their TV screens, on their laptops, on their iPhones, wherever. They've watched the images of those Kahanists, those racist Kahanists walking around and shouting death to Arabs. They watched it right. in broad daylight, in the evening, everywhere, marching you know, right in the middle, in the heart of the old city of, of Jerusalem. So again, you, you cannot hide these things. People might, politicians is one, are one thing, they can bury their heads in the sand, but, the, but, but the genie is out of the bottle and people see these things. Well, that- You're listening to Arab talk on KPO San Francisco, 89.5 FM. Well, that's why I think, Jamal, that the Armenian declaration by President Biden may portend some positive movement along the lines of acknowledging the atrocities that have been and continue to be committed against Palestinians. Let's not forget that the Democratic Party is moving more in a more progressive manner, more progressive politics. Not fast enough. Not fast enough, but we know that the demographic changes in this country and the demographic changes within the Democratic Party are going to point to a more progressive politics. And part of that progressive politics is to acknowledge the reality of Israeli apartheid and to stop the cover that the United States continues to give the Israeli government for their illegal practices and their ethnic cleansing. So while I, I want I, I think we need to acknowledge the positive of the Human Rights Watch uh, report. It's it's really great. We need to remind ourselves and our listeners and our viewers that it's one step. And not to get too excited, it's great, but it's one step, one step forward, and we need to continue to push. Look, it's, a sm- it's one step, it's a big step, and it is not a coincidence, and this is something I want to talk briefly about, that the uh, Israeli occupation army said that the detention, remember we spoke about this about a month ago, of the five Palestinian children in uh, South Hebron Hills uh, was a mistake. A mis- what, what's a mistake time. mean, Jamal? That was a mistake. They said that they. this is when last month uh, the Israeli soldiers detained five Palestinian children between the ages of 8 and 13 after settlers in an illegal 
outpost basically reported that they had trespassed. Look who's reporting who's trespassing. These are the thieves, the settlers, or in Hebrew, the Ganavim, the, the thieves. They, they, they're accusing these poor kids, you know, trespassing in the hills where, you know, basically they play around right. in the hills. So finally, the Israeli military sent a letter to their lawyer, Gabi Lasky, expressing regret you know, you know, and that's not a coincidence that this comes right when this uh, exactly. report, the human rights report, was issued. They they express regret over the incident, saying that, and I'm quoting, it was apparent that some of the children were under the age of criminal responsibility. I don't know what's you know, the, uh, you know, because under Israeli law, children below the age of 12 cannot be held criminally liable for their actions. Well, there was. Nothing. They, they, they did not commit any crimes. No. And, and they've been arresting children under the age of 12, beating them and shooting at them with rubber bullets and what have you, and, and including live ammunition, like what happened when they killed all the children who were playing at the beach in Gaza. Right. Like, they, they think that we have short-term memory, right? Uh, well. And, and, and then they it's signed, they're saying uh, there was no cause to detain these minors by the military force. This is a first yeah. again. Yeah, yeah. And we, we, I think you're right, Jamal, we have to take that seriously, that this is not a random occurrence, that it's in, occurring in the context of the larger international movement of trying to, attempting to hold the Israelis accountable for their brutal uh, and vicious and illegal attacks on Palestinian children. We, we, we have reported on this, Jamal, but we, we need to report on it, I guess, more the hundreds of uh, Palestinian children that remain under indefinite detention by the Israeli military without any due process or due cause and subjected to harsh, if not techniques consistent with torture. I mean, l let's, let's call it what it is. I mean, they have been arresting and torturing Palestinian children and holding them in indefinite detention for decades and decades and decades. And they continue to do it, Jamal. So the Human Rights Watch, uh, you know, report comes at a time that it's not that the threshold has been crossed. Really, what we should say, Jamal, is the threshold has been crossed psychologically for Human Rights Watch because really nothing has changed in the one week or the one year. I mean, no, I mean, in that report, this is what Palestinians have been talking about for decades. For decades. decades. I mean, there is nothing that surprises you or me, but it's a big, uh, you know, uh, it's going to have a big impact, in my opinion. Well, we'll continue to report on this, Jamal, and... I'll be very interested. I mean, the first salvos of the Hasbara, of course, were Human Rights Watch, even though, you know, as you said, the executive director is Jewish. Human Rights Watch is anti-Semitic. They even called Beth Selim anti-Semitic. So, well, that, that's the go-to kind of word. Well, that's know, their, that's when, their default. When they run default. out of any defense or argument, it's easy, which is a shame, which, which is a shame because it's kind of like, dilutes the meaning of anti-Semitism. And it's a, it's a slap in the face to all those people who uh, sadly have suffered, basically, from anti-Semitism. That's right, Jamal. But, you know, this will continue to be a big story. I mean, I know I'm looking forward to the ICC, you know, investigation and, and seeing what happens with that final report, if they, in fact, will bring charges against various Israeli politicians and military officials for the you know, for the war crimes that they've committed and continue to commit. So this could be a very interesting year. And now, Jamal, just in the larger political context of the United States, you know, Benjamin Netanyahu, who's in a very tough position right now, obviously, doesn't have his buddy Donald Trump to give him cover in, you know, from the executive branch. He has Joe Biden, who is a proud Zionist and has said as much, is not giving uh, Netanyahu or the Israelis a lot of uh, the, the love that they got from Donald Trump. Well, he might not actually, uh, if he reaches an agreement with Gantz, he actually there were talks about him sitting, sitting it out for the first uh, two years. You know, and then coming back in two years. Well, he might have to come back from jail. Jamal, we only have a few minutes left, and I want you to give our listeners an update on Palestinian elections. 
I mean, are we or are we not going to have elections in Palestine after so many years of delay, delay, delay? I mean, come on, when is the Palestinian Authority going to, you know, let the people, let, let the people on the ground decide who should represent them? Well, as we're speaking, Jess, um, Mahmoud Abbas is, is in a meeting. And uh, so I apologize to our uh, listeners and our viewers because by the time this broadcast, uh, we put this on the air, a decision would have been made. But What uh, do you think, though? But what I'm thinking is there might be a postponement uh, or uh, even postponing the decision now uh, because it does not look good for uh, President Mahmoud Abbas or, or to the Fatah party if they hold elections. I mean, this is, I'm just looking at it in a pragmatic way because Fatah, as we are speaking, has split its uh, coalition into three. So, right. so they are split into three, which is a disaster for Fatah, right? Because we know what happened in 2006. That's if right. You, if you remember 2006, uh, we saw Hamas win in a landslide, it was a landslide. victory right. after campaigning a, in a basically, they didn't even spend a lot of money. They just said that the uh, Fatah and, and the Palestinian Authority were, they, their main campaign was corruption. And people bought into this and, and basically it sparked the crisis. And we know what happened after that, that the United States stepped in. and Israel, they stepped in and, and reverse these elections. I mean, it, it, you know, people don't talk about that, you know. I mean, whether you like Hamas or you, or you dislike them, you agree with them, you, but they won fair and square and they got basically, uh, you know, gotten rid of. Now, their popularity now has fallen. They're not as popular as they were in 2006 because conditions in Gaza have steadily deteriorated, but they remain unified. That's the difference between them and Fatah, Hamas remains unified, right. they are disciplined, and Fatah is split into three rival par parliamentary lists. And it will be, and Mahmoud Abbas knows, if he holds the elections on time, uh, you know, they're gonna lose. He is 85 years old, everyone around him is 70 and over. I mean, this is the leadership. This is the so-called change. And they're always talking about giving uh, the new, you know, the young generation Yeah, well, platform. the young being 70 years old, I guess. <laughs> yeah, so the young is being 70, and Mahmoud Abbas is 85. If they run today the way it is, they are guaranteed to lose. So uh, are they going to, going to postpone? My prediction they will postpone. If they postpone, it means it will never happen because they postponed also, also in 2016. So every time they say talk, they talk about postponement, we're not talking about postponing it a month or two. We're talking about years to come. But he is in a pickle because all eyes are on him. All eyes are on Fatih. Even uh, the, 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 the leaders of those three three. Um, uh, parliamentary list, they want the elections to happen. Of course. Because they're kind of sick and tired to see the same old people uh, running the show. And so what he might do is he's going to use the excuse of Jerusalem because Israel does not want Jerusalemites to vote, you know, even though uh, under the uh, interim so-called peace agreement <laughs> that never reached in 1990, the Oslo uh, Palestinians were supposed to, uh, in Jerusalem, were supposed to vote, and even 6,000 of them, some around 6,000, and Diana Buta talks about that, they were e even should be allowed to submit their, their ballots through Israeli posts, and the others will have to either travel to Ramallah or other places and cast their vote. Israel saying, no, they cannot vote. So that could be okay. his veil to kind of hide behind and said, it's not we're not going to hold the elections until, until Jerusalemites vote, which might never happen. Yeah, it's it's really disappointing, Jamal, because probably what's going to happen is that Mahmoud Abbas will get sick, he'll pass on, you know, at some point, obviously, he's 85, as you said, his health is not great. And then there'll be a power vacuum uh, left in the electorate, and it'll be much more difficult to hold elections in this more, even more chaotic situation. So, 
a, a real leader would would let there be elections and let this process take hold and let the people decide who they want to represent them. And we can hope and continue to hope that, uh, you know, that will happen so that Palestinians can decide for themselves who, to, who represents them. Well, on that note, uh, you've been listening to Arab Talk on KPOO San Francisco 89.5 FM. Go to our website, arabtalkradio.com to download all our shows there. And we will talk to you next week. See you then.